Okay. So good afternoon and welcome to Praxis Peace Institute's Planetary Pause series. I'm Georgia Kelly and today we are honored to have a longtime Praxis friend and speaker at many of our conferences and events through the years, David Corton. David is, um, his topic today is Economics for an Ecological Civilization. He holds an MBA and PhD degrees and is internationally known author, speaker, active citizen, and former professor at Harvard Business School. He lived and worked in international development in Africa, Asia, and Latin America for 30 years on a mission to end global poverty, which is how he awakened. So he now works to raise global consciousness on the social and environmental devastation wrought by the unrestrained abuses of power practiced by transnational corporations. His focus is on building understanding and commitment to humanity's imperative to transition to an ecological civilization. He issues a bold call to replace Wall Street's phantom wealth machine with a new financial system devoted to the needs of real wealth of mainstream, Main Street economies. He is currently framing a life-centric economics to displace the money-centric egonomics that celebrates potentially terminal economics dysfunction. He's also the co-founder of Yes Magazine, the president of the Living Economies Forum, and a member of the Club of Rome. He writes a regular column for Yes and is the author of numerous books that we've read in our Praxis Book Club, including Change the Story, Change the Future, A Living Economy for a Living Earth, Agenda for a New Economy, From Phantom Wealth to Real Wealth, and the international bestseller, When Corporations Rule the World. So welcome, David. I'm going to let you just take it away. Georgia. <laughs> Thank you so much for organizing this extraordinary series of conversations, and especially for giving me this opportunity to share some of my current thinking. Then we go on to learn from all of you as we share what you're currently experiencing and we push our thinking deeper together. So humanity is in a process of awakening to the depth of the changes in our choice of values, institutions, technology, and infrastructure essential to our well-being and that of Earth. Everything we know tells us that a deep transformation must now be achieved with impossible speed. Our current choices are disrupting Earth's ability to maintain the stability of its climate, its supplies of fresh water, the fertility of its soils, the breathability of its air and its species diversity. We are dealing with deep system failure. Marginal adjustments will not do. Our current situation requires a transformation in our understanding of the nature and purpose of life and what it means to be human. The emerging favored term for the future you must create together is an ecological civilization, which is the theme of the current issue of Yes Magazine. Now, two statistics sum up our current crisis. According to estimates of the Global Footprint Network, it would require 1.7 Earth planets to sustain the current level of human consumption. Well, surprise, we have only one Earth. And yet even before COVID-19 shut down much of the economy, a majority of Earth's human population faced a dehumanizing daily struggle to survive, while a tiny minority among us indulged in displays of obscene opulence. Last year, in January of 2020, the combined wealth of just 26 billionaires exceeded that of the poorest half of humanity. That's 3.9 billion people. As the excluded struggle to survive the increased pressure of the COVID-19 crisis, the world's richest billionaires enjoyed a bonanza so extreme that the business news now publishes daily financial results for the world's richest people. As one example, on November 12, 2020, 
it reported that the total net worth of Jeff Bezos on that day, the world's richest person, stood at $183 billion. Oh, poor Jeff. He was down $1.5 billion from the day before, but he was up $68 billion from the beginning of the year of COVID-19. Meanwhile, a global population of 7.8 billion people continues to grow, thus putting ever further human pressure on an already overstressed Earth and increasing ever-growing pressure on what remains. This is an unprecedented global scale societal failure. Yet current economic theory assumes that human well-being is best secured by competing to maximize our personal financial returns so we can grow our personal consumption and thus grow the gross domestic product of our respective nations. This deeply flawed economic theory is known technically as neoliberal economics. It is more accurately described as egonomics because it assumes a world of egocentric individuals seeking individual gratification through ever-growing personal consumption. This version of economics is actually a flawed political ideology, not science. Its claim to legitimacy rests in part on the deeply flawed theory of evolutionary biology that the most successful species are the most ruthless competitors. Now, as uh, Georgia mentioned, her next re webinar next week will present new paradigm evolutionary biologist Elizabeth Satoris, who has long demonstrated that the key to life success is actually cooperation. Don't miss it. I expect to see you there. Egonomic theory has an additional flaw. It embraces money as the defining measure of wealth and well being, ignoring the fact that money is just a number that banks create from nothing with a computer keystroke. Another big surprise we cannot eat, drink, or breathe money. It will not warm us on a cold night, nor will it stabilize the climate. It can buy only that which is for sale. Real value is created by the labor of Earth's living beings. That, of course, includes human labor. Yet because we accept money in exchange for things of real value, money gives those who possess it extraordinary power over those who do not. The more, the more money that an individual has, the more easily he or she can outbid others in the marketplace. This allows those whose labor is devoted simply to gaming the financial system to gain control of the real wealth created by those who produce what is essential to our well-being without themselves producing anything of actual value. A viable human future depends on our successful transition to the institutions of an ecological civilization structured to empower and reward those who provide the productive labor essential to the well being of people at Earth. This requires the guidance of a new economics, an economics, eco as in ecology, grounded in an understanding of another fundamental truth. Life exists only in diverse communities of living beings that self-organize together to create and maintain the conditions essential to their individual and collective well-being. I am because of the bees that pollinate, the trees that produce oxygen, the beetles that replenish the soil by aiding the decomposition of dead plants, the microbes that digest the food in my gut and recycle my waste, and the people who love and care for me as I love and care for them. 
Without these many diverse beings, Earth would be just another dead rock floating in space. And I would not be experiencing the miracle of life. Now, if any aspect of this internal and external interdependence suffers serious disruption, I die. And it is the same for every living being, including the living Earth. Now, for some 200,000 years, humans lived in communities in direct relationship with one another and the other beings of the living Earth community. There emerged from the African experience, the birthplace of humanity, a distinctive insight into life's inherent interdependence. That insight is now confirmed by the leading edge of the physical, biological, and social sciences. Africans call it Ubuntu, commonly translated as, I am because you are. I am because you are. In its fullest meaning, Ubuntu acknowledges that all things are related and interdependent. From this wisdom follows an insight foundational to economics. We might call it the Ubuntu principle. My well being depends on your well being. I do best when we all do well. The frontiers of science now give us an ever deepening understanding of the interdependence of life. Quantum physics tells us that relationships, not particles, are the foundation of what we experience as material reality. Biology is finding that intelligent life exists only in diverse communities of choice making organisms that together through their labor create and maintain the conditions essential to their individual and collective existence. The social sciences are finding that humans get their greatest satisfaction from caring for other living beings. Powerful implications follow from the Ubuntu principle for how we address the purpose of the economy, the allocation of power in society, and the procreation of the human species. Call them the three Ps, purpose, power, and procreation. Let us take them one at a time. First is purpose. The purpose of an economy. Indeed, the purpose of a healthy society is the well-being of living people and the living earth. More specifically, it is to provide all people with material sufficiency and spiritual abundance while supporting the well-being, beauty, and creative unfolding of Earth's community of life. Put it in simple terms and it comes out more fun, less stuff. We must measure the performance of the economy using two panels of indicators, as proposed by Kate Walworth the author of Donut Economics. The first panel of indicators tracks the well-being of the living earth, and specifically the health of the regenerative systems by which earth maintains climate stability, ample supplies of fresh air and water, fertile soils, and beautiful landscapes. The second panel measures the well-being of people, all people, is everyone getting a nutritious diet, clean air and water, a secure and comfortable place to live and satisfying relationships and a sense of purpose? Are our families and communities strong and thriving? Are our children healthy, happy, and learning? Now, if these measures are all strong, we should have no reason in the slightest to care whether this misleading number we call GDP is going up or down. Next comes power. For the economy to achieve its intended purpose, power must reside in people committed to the well being of Earth and all its living beings. 
The people of each place must have sufficient control of their own resources to adapt to the distinctive and often dramatically different local circumstances presented by meadow, mountain, jungle, desert, Arctic, and other landscapes. To deal with its distinctive needs and opportunities, each community must learn to care for and to live within the limits of the regenerative potential of their community's territory. So long as each community meets its needs through its own labor and self-reliant balance with its local ecosystems, Earth's community of life remains in balance with itself and Earth. In an ecological civilization, securing each community against predatory colonization from outside its borders is a major responsibility of the institutions of national and global government. Within this frame, all institutions, including the institutions of business, must be accountable to the community they serve. Now take note that the publicly traded limited liability for-profit corporations hold a legal license to acquire unlimited economic power accountable only to faceless, placeless owners who trade their shares in placeless financial markets seeking instant profit with no regard for social or environmental consequences. Such corporations are mortal enemies of democracy, markets, and life. Illegitimate institutions with no place in the ecological civilization to which we must now transition. More appropriate to our needs are local family businesses and worker community owned cooperatives whose owners have strong community roots and a deep personal interest in their community's well-being. That would be like the, the cooperative institutions of Mondragon, which are uh, you know, one of, um, one of uh, Georgia's major uh, occupations. Equally obsolete is the current system of monopolistic private for-profit banks that create money by issuing interest-bearing debt that can be repaid only so long as GDP growth is generating sufficient new debt to pay the interest on outstanding debt. We must learn to organize around what makes communities most healthy rather than around what makes corporations most profitable. Now we come to the third P, procreation. This is our need to manage the continuing regeneration of the human species to maintain our balance with one another and earth while fulfilling the potentials and responsibilities of our humanity. Life replenishes and renews itself through continuing cycles of conception, birth, maturation, adulthood, death, and rebirth. These cycles are essential to life's resilience, regeneration, and continuing evolution toward ever greater diversity, beauty, awareness, and creative potential. As we advance in our ability to improve human health and delay our own death, we must simultaneously learn to manage our human reproduction to limit our total numbers and distribute ourselves to maintain balance with Earth's regenerative systems in every place where we humans live. The key to, our, to limiting our numbers resides in recognition that women control their fertility if provided with education, attractive career opportunities, and the means of fertility control. The more daunting challenge is the necessary redistribution of the human population as ever more of Earth's places are rendered socially and environmentally unlivable by reckless human choices. Most people prefer to remain in the place they know as home for so long as that is a viable option. 
We will all benefit from cooperative efforts to restore the livability of each of Earth's places wherever possible. Our future depends on a dramatic transformation in our understanding of ourselves and our relationships with one another and Earth. It begins with taking seriously the care and education of our children and the truth that it takes a village to raise a child. The human family has more than enough abused and neglected children. What we lack is adequate attention to the care and development of all our children. Imagine a world in which every child is a wanted child and all children are loved and supported by a caring community of people committed to actualizing the fullness of their humanity. We never outgrow our need for learning, nor our need for a village. Our need from birth is to learn how to learn together and to do so throughout our lives, a task at which conventional textbook education wholly fails. The disruptions of COVID-19 have exposed with uncommon clarity the dramatic failures of a society seduced by an ideology of self-centered competition. We must now see more clearly the imperative to transition to an ecological civilization that recognizes the interdependence of life and the responsibilities that go with our distinctive human ability to choose our common future. This awakening makes the COVID-19 shutdown an unprecedented opportunity to engage the transition to the culture, institutions, technology, and infrastructure of the ecological civilization on which a healthy earth community and viable human future depend. Recognition of the consequences of our global embrace of the deeply flawed ideology of egonomics is not new. Contributors to ecological and heterodox schools of economics have been advocating alternatives for decades. These efforts commonly challenge GDP as the defining measure of economic performance, acknowledge planetary boundaries, and argue for action to reduce economic inequality. We need to build on their insights as we develop an economics dedicated to actualizing the potentials of our humanity. The time has come to clearly and unambiguously acknowledge the essential wisdom of our ancestors who recognized as the leading edge of science now affirms that our individual well-being is inseparable from the well-being of our neighbors and a living earth. We must also acknowledge that money which has no existence outside the human mind can be a useful economic tool that becomes a deadly threat when pursued as an egonomic purpose. There is much work ahead as we find our way to a materially sufficient and spiritually abundant human future for all as a living human earth community. So Georgia, okay. back to you. <laughs> Thank you, David. This is really wonderful. Lots of things to think about. And I do have a few questions, but I actually thought, well, maybe none of them are relevant, but I'm going to dive in anyway, because we will have other questions as well. I want to mention that the last couple of books we've read in the, pra in the Praxis Book Club have been Carl Polanyi's The Great Transformation and a couple of books by Hannah Arendt. And though these books were written 70 and 90 years ago, they highlighted the capitalist imperative that requires endless growth on a finite planet. So this problem, as you mentioned too, has been known and written about for decades, and yet they have not gotten the traction that they needed in our society. And I think with what you're doing, defining economics, uh, making that a different way of looking at economic relationships is an important step to educating people about looking at economics differently. Um, and the focus on cooperation, I'm particularly interested in the focus on cooperation, as you mentioned, and the um, what I think is the need, and I want to get your opinion on this, to not always refer to the new economics as any way capitalist, but to drop that term 
<laughs> and to start looking at a new way to define the economics that really will uh, support humanity and the planet. Uh, I, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. That is a fascinating question, Georgia. Um, you know, it partly depends on who you're talking to and uh, your politics. Uh, but it really all turns on how you define capitalism. I always thought capitalism meant um, markets and private ownership. So by that definition, your Mondragon cooperatives are capitalist institutions. You could also call them socialist institutions, but the truth is capitalism and socialism both, as we currently define them, are about the centralization and concentration of power in ways that are ultimately harmful to the environment and depressing of our, of our humanity. Um, so I guess in my view, how, what, you, what you call it depends on who you're talking to. A lot of people are, feel more comfortable if you say, well, no, this is a version of capitalism. We're, uh, we're familiar with the bad faces of capitalism, but it, it can have a positive face. The essential issues deal with ownership and rather than putting that ownership and that power in centralized institutions, we really need to, need to root it in institutions of community that are aligned with the interests of that community. Well, that's where Mondragon it doesn't use either term. They don't use the term socialist. They don't use the term capitalist. Part of it is because they're they're trying to define a new way of doing economic relationships. So yeah. I, I think economics is a really great word that can get us out of those um, uh, mindsets. Uh, one other question before I go to the to yeah. uh, the audience, and that's about the three things you mentioned: purpose, power, and procreation. Procreation. This seems to be a real hot button issue that no one wants oh to deal with seriously. Some say that the developed world, especially the U.S., uses more resources than the undeveloped world, so that population isn't really the problem, but overconsumption is. So how do you speak to that? Y yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's an old frame. Um, you know, back in the... Uh, in the 1970s, uh, Fran and I, our, our primary focus was on family planning and, and issues of population growth. And that was a claim way back then. Um, it, you know, it, 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 it's true as long as the poor want to stay poor. But our goal is to raise the poor out of their poverty and the more the more individuals, the, the, the higher our total population, the harder it is to bring everybody up to a livable standard of living. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and clearly, I mean, this, uh, you know, as a member of the Club of Rome, uh, you know, much of my analysis began back in, you know, 1972 with the, the limits to growth study, which, you know, laid this out so clearly with uh, computer models. Um, that we, we simply have to, uh, to limit our consumption. Um, so we have to limit both our consumption and our population and recognize that if we're gonna meet everyone's uh, you know, legitimate needs on this finite earth, uh, we probably cannot allow population to, to grow much beyond what it is now. And we will actually be more comfortable if we can, uh, can reduce the total population. Yeah, I just had heard that argument recently again. I know it's an old frame, but, yeah. <laughs> but it's still being recycled. So yeah. now we're going to open this up to the audience. So anyone who wants to ask a question, please raise your hand. And oh, when you're called on, you can I raise my hand here. Uh, oh. There's an automatic place to raise your hand. Please do not unmute until um, okay. automatic. until you're called upon. So I don't see any hands raised at the moment. Have we? Oh, okay, Gil. I definitely. Oh. You can unmute yourself, Gil. I don't see a way to electronically raise my hand, so I have to do it the old fashioned way. David, thank you so much um, for the clarity and articulateness of what you've presented. Uh, I was really struck that you referred repeatedly to the living world. And I'm practicing um, um, overcoming a bad habit. I'm, I'm trying to purge the words nature. Mm. and natural resources and even natural capital from my vocabulary mm -hmm. uh, in favor of talking about the living world as 
you know, that we are a part of, not separate from, as the way to frame that. Um, you know, you spoke about capitalism, and I think it's important to be clear that, that commerce and capitalism aren't the same thing. We've had commerce forever. Yeah, exactly. Thousands and thousands of years. Capitalism is less than, what, 300 years old, mm -hmm. 400 years old. And I've been taking to hyphenating the word, you know, and talking about capitalism because it privileges oh. capital. Over, you know, there, there are three ways, three places wealth comes from, right? Capital, labor, and soil. Mm -hmm. And the game that we're in says capital is all that matters. So that's why I call it capitalism. Um, my question for you is uh, sorry, um, is uh, you, the, the headline talked about ecological civilization. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. And you know that the, you know, China. Uh, unknown in the West, China has that in their national policy. Um, I've seen a little bit of conversation about it in esoteric journals. Uh, it's not in the mainstream of conversation. It would be great if you could unpack a little bit what that means, what ecological civilization means to you and how we move in that direction. Yeah, essentially the way I, the way I use the term ecological civilization, uh, <clears throat> is that it's a name for the outcomes that, that I described. And I, I, I think that probably most all the people here are ultimately committed to. Um, the, it, 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 it did get its, it, 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 its, its primary impetus uh, from China and it is interestingly written into both the, uh, the, the Communist Party Constitution of China and the National Constitution. Uh, I was introduced to the term through that China Association. And I actually made two trips to China at the invitation of the, of the Chinese to engage in uh, conferences on, on that theme. And one of the things that I have found extremely troubling is that China experiences essentially the same thing that we do. You know, and the term that is so common here, sustainable development, it comes out even in, uh, you know, in, the, in what I call the unsustainable UN sustainable development goals, um, which includes a commitment to perpetual economic growth. And what I realized on my most recent visit to China is that very few of the Chinese who were speaking in these conferences were using the term ecological civilization. And they were talking about what I came to understand what they, they, they call the two mountain theory. One mountain is sustainability and environmental protection. The other mountain is economic growth. Now, Fran points out to me, you know, you got two mountains here. Has anyone ever climbed two mountains at the same time? No, it's, it's an inherent impossibility. Uh, but the reality of China is that it's, it, it's essentially torn between the environmental vision and what is, well, what they've proven is that the, the Communists can be the most predatory capitalists in the world. Um, and they're, you know, as we see them expanding out into Latin America and Africa and other places, uh, they have become the most effective colonial power in history. Um, they know how to do it so much better than any of their predecessors. Um, now, in terms of the term capital itself, one of the traps that we've got to recognize here is the very definition of capital. When we use the term capital, are we really talking about money or are we talking about the real wealth? I mean, real capital is land. It is in fact labor. 
it is useful knowledge, it is love, but capital in terms of that which you need to be productive does not include money. And yet, uh, you know, that's part of the, the, the distraction of our, of our language uh, that the economists totally exploit, that they never refer to money, they refer to capital as if it is something real rather than just something that banks are creating by churning their computers. It's not just banks, there's other, <laughs> there's other aspects of that computer process also, but for simplicity, we can just refer to the banks. Anyhow, is that, <clears throat> is that a helpful answer? <laughs> Gil, you're, you're muted. Well, that's okay. Well, I'll, I'll say, I'll say yes, David. Go on, let's go. Down. <laughs> Thank you. Obviously it could be a longer conversation, but <laughs> yeah, very long. <laughs> and, and maybe if we don't have enough uh, questions, we can come back. But I noticed Ben, you've got your hand up. So you want to um, ask your question? Yes, um, glad to uh, hear you speak again, David. I've seen you at a couple of Praxis workshops and uh, very much appreciated your work. Uh, I think, you know, a number of us uh, bridle um, at, at uh, any description of trying to sustain capitalism because for both, for the socialist wing here, uh, that is the root of the problem. Uh, Richard Wolf, who's been a regular Praxis speaker, I listened to his economic update and he's thoroughly trained me in dialectical analysis of our economy. And he says, capitalism is like living with an unstable girlfriend <laughs> that, it, <laughs> that has you know, breakups and storms every six to eight years. So it is uh, the mechanism of, of capitalism, I think, is incompatible with the continued growth, you know, the continued survival of the species. I'm, I'm with you on that. I like your term economics as maybe a way of bridging that gap because there are people for whom the concept of free market is a quasi religious belief, which they're never going to surrender to the day they die. There's people like myself, red diaper kids who like, you know, we're never going to promote any um, gussied up version of capitalism, like conscious capitalism or any such nonsense. <laughs> but I think that we're actually seeing the change happening right now with the what the Biden administration did, uh, which is as, as there's full ramifications of it has come to that they have moved past the austerity economics that governed the elites of both parties for decades. And um, I think that they have substantially changed the game. So what, what, you know, I can see just as a project is that they're inserting, they're creating the beginning of a new social welfare state, a more comprehensive one. I think it's gonna be, going to be very difficult to rescind things like the child the child credits, the monthly payments to people with children. That is a feature that's here to stay. So that coupled with an understanding that ratcheting down the mechanism of capitalism is necessary in order for us to survive. So the economics, I'm, I'm, I'm working with that as a term that might bridge the gap between people who have a socialist or a capitalist you know, operating system. Yeah, the, in a way, what we're dealing with here is an issue of messaging. And of course, the reality we face is that if you're messaging, you need to be conscious of the existing mental frame of the people that we're communicating with and trying to put it within their frame. There's also, this is a dilemma that we've been confronting in the Club of Rome, um, that as our current co-chairs, and this, any of you are familiar with the Club of Rome may know that it was founded pretty much as an all-male organization, and now it's headed by two women co-chairs who are totally uh, transforming the organization, and I would say in mostly all very positive ways. Uh, so it's part of the progress that, uh, that we're making. But 
the two co-chairs, one of them has been focused on what she frames as the emergency, which is the climate emergency or more broadly, the environmental emergency that we have to find actions almost instantly to deal with and very dramatic actions. Uh, so that defines the club's emergency initiative. And that recognizes that basically has to be achieved within the languaging and the institutional frame that exists. Even though that, <laughs> that frame and that language is contrary to the outcome we seek. Um, a, a, a very perplexing um, conflict. The other co-chair is focused on what we call the emergence initiative, emergence, which is essentially the ecological civilization framing, which we recognize, you know, not only requires fundamentally different institutions uh, that shift power in new ways, it requires a fundamental shift in the human mental frame and how we think about ourselves. So these two, the emergency and the emergence are initially in conflict and it's fascinating the conversations and the difficulties of those conversations of finding approaches and finding messages that begin to meld the two so that the actions that you're focusing on for the emergence are also consistent with the actions you have to take uh, and the, the the actions you take on emergency are consistent with the actions you have to take on emergence i mean this is just getting further into the complexity of the reality that we're that we're dealing with Okay, I see we have someone, I, I don't see the name, but iPhone, who, would you identify yourself? Elizabeth uh, also put her hand up. Yeah, uh -huh. Ned Orrit is one, maybe you may have seen that. Okay, yeah, there was someone with an iPhone and I can't okay. get so to, so to raise your hands, guys, you can hit the reactions button and then there's an option to raise your hands. Um, I, I raise, I put my hand up. Yeah, so we've I, got... I, I've got, I think Julie. Oh, okay, so Julie, go ahead. And then Ned. Hi, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. And I want to share something that I saw recently. Someone said about the 26 billionaires, I have something that they don't have. I have enough. <laughs> and that really struck me. And the other thing is, I heard um, Richard Wolf on Tom Hartman just yesterday or today talking about the food instability crisis that is looming at us. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you have anything to say about that. Thanks. Yeah, um, beautifully put. I mean, part of um, part of that statement, I have enough, actually raises the reality that being a billionaire is dehumanizing. This gets into a frame that I was introduced to on my first visit to South Africa during the transition from apartheid. And I was actually there to teach in a, in a workshop for former members of the, uh, of, of the African Union, well, the, the South Africa, the, well, but the people who were in prison with Nelson Mandela. And the thing that just blew my mind from that experience that I had never encountered anything like it before was when these people imprisoned by the white South Africans said in all sincerity, that experience 
dehumanized our jailers just as it dehumanized us. And that absolutely applies to being a billionaire. I've had just enough contact with billionaires to know that among the other complexities of their life, they realize that every person who approaches them does so not because they care about them, but because they want a piece of their money. Can you imagine what that does to you? You know, in terms of the food emergency, um, <clears throat> I, I didn't happen to hear that particular episode of Tom Hartman. He's a close friend and, and <laughs> one of my favorite uh, radio hosts. Um, but if, you know, if you look at what's happening in terms of the environmental situation, we are destroying our sources of fresh water and we are destroying the, the health and vitality of our soils. Well, what do we depend on to grow our food? We depend on the water and the soil. So at least in, in that sense, if nothing else, um, we are headed for a food emergency unless we begin to fundamentally transform how we approach agriculture and uh, all the ways in which we, we treat Earth so that uh, recognizing the need to restore the regenerative capacities on which we depend for our water and soil. Okay, um, I'm going to go to Ned next. Well, oh, thank you. Thank you, Georgia. And thank you, David Corton. This is fabulous. I'd like to go back to just a little bit. The food was great, but uh, also the, the idea of emergency and emergence. Mm -hmm. I'm working on a, I'm, uh, with our local city on climate work and we, we certainly grasp, grasp the idea of emergency. Reading all the IPCC reports, we, we decided we've got to go for a climate neutral by 2030. But definitely an emergency. We realize that's a huge lift. Um, so what's rising for me now as I'm working on this is how can we couple emergence with this? How can we make the transformation and with our institutions into the ecological civilization but it seems like there's there's quite a an idea to kind of take shortcuts and stay with the the solution sets that we're used to within the industrial economy well, we've got to shift the whole works it may have to be a sequential thing i don't know um your last issue of yes magazine brought forward uh, kate raworth's work and some cities are are incorporating that, but but it's because that that would reveal some of the dis, the discontinuities mm -hmm. uh, with industrial culture, but it seems so difficult to bring that into uh, things we can measure and create metrics that we can steer by. Uh, but maybe you know something about that. I just don't know how to bring this home so we can uh, be aware of where we are in this space and can we really start working on making a transition to something completely different. You say it's not a subtle change we're talking about. It's very deep. Um, so anyway, that that's, I don't know if I made it very clear, but. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, part of, part of what I'm realizing, you know, it's emerging out of the conversations in which I'm uh, involved is that the transition is not going to be a kind of straight line linear transition. It is going to be extremely chaotic. And one of the things that's happening that's giving me hope, just as you, as you mentioned the conversations going on in your community, and part of what's fascinating to me about my life is, is living here with, with my wife, Fran, um, we're both on the same mission, but most of my attention is focused on these discussions at a global level and kind of the global framing, just exactly what we've discussed here. Fran is totally focused on our local community here on Bainbridge Island and all sorts of groups that are working around issues of energy and our conflict with our local uh, electricity supplier who uses coal and wants to make it all gas and so forth and trying to push them to new frameworks, but also working with the city around issues of transportation and can we 
you know, what are all the things we can be doing to move people from uh, automobiles to walking and bicycling? Um, and what does that mean, you know, in terms of, you know, how we develop trails and the, uh, you know, the, the, the facilities for bikers and walkers to, to feel safe, particularly in a, in a setting that, that has extraordinary hills. Um, but this, you know, this goes on at the same time as these global institute, these global conversations. And <clears throat> even there, I'm, I'm seeing indications that at least within some corporations, you know, some of the leaders are beginning to realize, oh my God, the, uh, uh, you know, this is a, this is a terrible situation. And, uh, you know, I've, I've talked to religious leaders who attend the World Economic Forum, forum and tell me that corp, you know, they have the experience of corporate CEOs coming knocking on their door in the middle of the night asking for a, a confessional session to talk about how they're torn by the sins that they're essentially forced to commit as heads of these corporations. Um, now that has not solved the problem and we are, are foolish if we expect that they're gonna solve it. But it is important to recognize those forces, uh, which potentially we've, you know, we've got to get these folks, we've got to be thinking about the fundamental transformation of those institutions. Now, we're also becoming much more aware, I think, you know, like here in the United States, uh, about our institutions of government. You know, we grow up, we convince ourselves that we're a democracy. I <laughs> bought into that sham for a long time. If you really look at the history, I was having these fa fantastic conversations with, with Tom Hartman uh, about, <clears throat> you know, if you, if you look at it, we've never really been a democracy in terms of, you know, everyone's voice being heard and uh, making decisions as a community. Um, that from the very start, the only people that had a vote in the United States were uh, white landowners, you know, even a white man, well, white male landowners. So even if you're a white male, but you didn't own property, you couldn't vote. Um, and of course, many of those property owners were slaveholders and some da 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 da. Um, and we're, you know, you know we're be beginning, we've certainly now seen exposed how extraordinarily undemocratic our, our institutions are. Um, so I don't know how that, <laughs> I'm not sure how that, that, that answers your question. It's just, you know, it's part of recognizing that we each need to do what we can within the place where we are uh, moving forward, both the thinking in terms of the larger vision and the action, but always with the recognition that none of us has the answer and no one action is going to solve the problem uh, that it, all has to come together in a very deep and fundamental way. It's a really critical piece, what you just said, David, that it's not one answer, it's not one system, it's not one person, it's a combination. And that right. is very hard to teach people who have set ideologies. Oh boy. Very, very, very difficult. So that's part of our uh, work, I think, is to talk to people about that. We've got two uh, well, One other thing I wanna put in here, um, be, be, just so I don't let it slip. Sure. I mean, th these are exactly the conversations that I'm dedicating my life to. And, you know, if, if I can be helpful to any of you in bringing this conversation into the groups that you work with, particularly if, you know, that, that, that are reaching out to influencers like yourselves, um, that's what I am devoting my current life to. That would be a wonderful topic to just focus on at one of our discussions. I think that would be really good and we can talk about that later. Um, I've got Elizabeth. two more questions. One is gonna be from your wife, David. 
Elizabeth had a has her hand up too, but she hasn't used the hand function. So okay, was she before Katie that... or not? Uh, yeah, I think she's been holding. She she it has was way back. She okay, yeah, yeah. so Elizabeth, you're going to be next, and then Katie, and then Fran, and then probably we'll be done. So Elizabeth, go ahead. Aloha uh, from Hawaii. Um, I had kind of fun with the, the closed caption said, said my name as Elizabeth said tourists. And, and I, just, I just wanted to point it out that uh, our Hawaiian ecosystems have done very well without all the tourists. So I'm, I'm not promoting tourism. Uh, anyway, I, the question I had, and I, this is probably late in the, in the uh, time we have together, Dave, but thank you so much for all you have done for so many years on, on working on what we can do with the current capitalism that, that we're under. And um, I wonder if you have read the book Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff, Harvard professor. Mm. It's a 600 page tome uh, to slog through, but basically it's about the transhumanism, uh, the technological solutions, the, the AI and IT people who want to improve on humans by tampering with ourselves and also to geoengineer and do things, things of that kind. And there seems to be this race between now, these, this very high tech transhumanism and the on the ground knowing exactly what we need to do to take care of our communities and hooray for Fran for balancing out your globalism with her localism. Yeah. Well, first, Elizabeth, I, I, I just want to acknowledge here with the group that back in uh, when I was in the process of my awakening to the nature of life and its interdependence, um, uh, it was Elizabeth and her work was one of the major influences on that. And we did a lot of activities together. And for that, I thank you. Um, <clears throat> now, in terms of the difficulty we have that moving this forward, um, you know, we have conversations in the Club of Rome that when, when the limits to growth, the book, the computer, uh, the computer model book came out in 1972, it got enormous global intention. I mean, the, the book sold millions of copies, and it was like on everybody's mind and tongue. But if you look at the politics at that time, it was also exactly the time when the sponsors of neoliberal economics uh, really came together and a few very wealthy people uh, started investing in pushing their message in every possible way. So you know, and, and they've since been buying up all media networks and, and so forth to push that message. And we have never had comparable support for the, the, the real message that, hey, <laughs> we're living beings on a living earth that has finite, final, finite limits. Um, so that is part of the problem. And now, as you mentioned, we're in this current uh, thing with the technocrats who well, I, I, I guess I don't know quite what so intrigues them, but uh, why we would want to get rid of, of humans and life on Earth so that we can produce robots to do all the work to support the robots. Uh, I mean, the doc, uh, we think of these guys as really smart. Some of them are fucking idiots. I mean, <laughs> and we have that on <laughs> you have to, you have to censor that, but um, I, I mean, it's just, it's just absurd, uh, including the idea of, well, if, if we destroy Earth's capacity to support life, we can always go off to Mars. Uh, I urge them to go as quickly as possible, but you know, they, they might want to notice that there's, <laughs> there's no air water <laughs> on Mars and the terrible temperatures and so forth. Have fun. Um, anyhow, that's, 
that's a whole other world. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 yeah. the idiocy of what we're up against. Um, but that, of course, is part of the hope because most any reasonably sane, intelligent human, if they take time to listen to the message that we're all trying to put forward, they get it. They get it. But it's it's hard to bring it into conversation because it's not enough part of the culture that you can you can talk about it without thinking people may think you're a little weird. Yeah, you know, Dave, Dave, I don't find it a mystery why the ITAI guys are doing this. There was a book long ago written by a man called Fathering the Unthinkable. And he pointed out that the first atomic bomb dropped when the, the telegram that the scientists who invented it sent to each other read three words, it's a boy. And so he pointed out that while women have long been accused of penis envy, womb envy seems to be a lot more problematic. And this is all about men who really believe that, that these robots are their children, are they, they're, they're, they're giving birth, they're improving on nature themselves. Oh, fascinating. That's the story. <laughs> improving on nature. I want to go on to the next question. So. Yeah, I mean, we're very conscious that women could get along with very few men. <laughs> But I, I'd never heard that framing before, that uh, this is a piece of the men thinking, oh, we could get rid of all the women and we can uh, we can do all the birthing. Yeah, oh. sure. so, <laughs> Crazy species. <laughs> I'm going to go to Katie. You're next. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Thank you, George, so much for bringing this to us. And David, I really find you so brilliant. I listened to your YouTubes today as well, and it's profoundly important. Um, I'll cut to the chase uh, because of time. Uh, to me, it seems to me cooperation and unification and, and all of that is um, it's profoundly important, if not essential, going forward. Uh, the fly in the ointment to me seems to be conflict and conflict resolution. That is my passion. And I wonder if you can comment on that because even amongst ourselves, if we were doing an endeavor, we would probably split off from each other at various points in argument. Ah, <clears throat> that would be a topic we could spend the rest of the week on. Well, <laughs> <laughs> That's a problem with our audience. <laughs> yeah, I, tell you, I, I mean, that brings to mind back to the, uh, to the Club of Rome. You know, the core of the Club of Rome is what they call their 100 full members, uh, most of which are, 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 are noted intellectuals that you know, think about the problematic, the, 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 the big issues. But it also became very evident that whenever we got together, you essentially had three or 100 egos uh, let me tell you my story <laughs> and my answer, and nobody was listening. Um, the extraordinary thing is happening. You, you know, now we can't have physical meetings, so instead of going to the other side of the world, uh, we get together on Zoom. And I don't know if you believe it, but we're actually having conversations. That's true. And we're beginning to learn from each other. Um, That's true. So it's, it's not a complete answer to your question, but it is, it is what has to happen. <laughs> Thank you. That's good. And, 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 and that's, that's, uh, that's part of our challenge right now. Um, and, and it's one of the reasons I think, you know, there's all sorts of important reasons that we do not go back to holding our conversations in physical meetings around the world. Um, our physical meetings need to be primarily within our own communities with people that we <laughs> walk next door and, and communicate with our neighbors about how we're going to put in bike paths or whatever, right. what are that's going to be about. And if we're going to have global uh, conversations, and unless we're planning to get together and mm -hmm. you know stay for a month or whatever, mm -hmm. um, those should be by Zoom or some other uh, electronic technology where we just sit down at our desk and bingo, we're, we're listening to each other. Yeah. I have found the same thing uh, doing all these programs every Friday and especially our discussions that we have once a month. 
that people really listen much more and they can say more and people listen more in the Zoom format that they do, than they do in person. So I completely concur with you, David. That's been mm. my experience as well. I'm going to go to Fran now. You have to answer your wife. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Actually, I am not going to ask him a question. I am going to comment on Ned Orrett because I was very impressed with your putting that emergence and emergency frame around what you're doing in your local community. And I here I'm married to Dave and I hear about this all the time, but I have not thought in exactly those terms in the work that we are doing here. But I just want to point out a really nice way that what we're trying to do kind of splits off into those two. And this is on transportation. So Dave's mentioned all these bike trails and everything. But as you meet that emergency challenge, the climate emergency challenge of transportation, one answer rooted in the industrial paradigm is electric cars. And there is so much enthusiasm for that. It's a really nice solution and the corporations are getting all on board. A transformative vision is in the emergence framework is to deprioritize cars altogether and get people doing their transportation if it's far by public transport, if it's really close by walking, and if it's medium by bike or electric bike. So I think that, that those two frameworks actually are very interesting right down to the local level. So thank you, Ned, for bringing that up. And thank you for putting an accent on it, Fran. I'm I, would, I, I want to just add quickly to that, that you know, Fran's focused on the transportation piece but another piece of exactly that same framing is reorganizing our infrastructure around communities at the local level so that you, you have you are organizing around local centers that maybe have their their grocery store and they you know they they have the essential facilities that people need so it's really easy to walk to you know, this is something that Fran and I learned when we lived in New York City, because in New York City, at least when we were there, the way it was organized, you could meet, well, you, you actually had to be out of your mind to own a car, because that was very expensive and very inconvenient and cumbersome. But if you wanted most of what you could get, you could get by walking. If, it, if not, you went and you got on the subway or a bus and you went very quickly to where you wanted to go. Okay, uh, Stephanie, I'm going to go to you next. <clears throat> I think that may be our last one. Stephanie? Where oh, well, thank you. Um, and thank you, everybody. Um, I'm very interested in, in those poor executives going to the faith leaders in the middle of the night. And um, I've been kind of following the World Economic Forum and the Global Reset and all that. Mm -hmm. And my question is, is anyone talking to those people about the the vision that you and probably everyone here is, um, you know, is guided by. I have the sense that we have a kind of richism that's comparable to racism in that anyone that's rich has to be another type of species and we don't talk to them. So I wondered if you know any anybody who is trying to communicate with them um, how we think and, and what we feel. Yeah, I am, there actually was a time in my life when I was in direct contact with Klaus Schwab, uh, who was the, the head of the World yeah. Economic Forum and found it to be quite an extraordinary individual, uh, uh, you know, this kind of European uh, intellect um, who can deal with these contradictions, <laughs> understands these deeper issues. Um, <clears throat> I have no contact with the World Economic Forum currently, and I haven't gotten any invitations to speak to them. <laughs> um, the truth is, the 
if you, you know, within the existing system, if you are a corporate CEO, you are extremely limited in what you can do. I mean, at least anything that goes outside of mm. maximizing profits because the ownership of the corporation rests with these financial markets. And any corporate CEO who is sacrificing significant profits for the benefit of the environment and workers, the community, that corporation's shares will be bought out by a, a predator uh, to weed out this inefficiency. Now, the conversation we need is ultimately not just these corporations changing their frame, which they can only do if we shift the ownership structure. And I, th I think the, 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 the really deep challenge and the really deep issue for me is, is there a path by which these corporations, if enough of the CEOs actually came together and agreed, you know, we got to change this system. And it's not just us being responsible, more responsible, but it has to involve a fundamental shift in ownership how do we transform ourselves from being publicly traded corporations to being worker owned? Now, it, it, it also requires breaking them up into all sorts of pieces, but it's, it's the combination of the breakup and the, um, the transformation of ownership, which of course ultimately will require both government action through public policy to change the rules and at the same time, uh, a, a, a real commitment by true corporate leaders to facilitate that kind of process internally. Uh, we're so far from it, I, I, I can't even quite imagine how it might happen. I just know it has to happen. That's, a, that's another conversation. Maybe we should have it in Mondragon. Um, I'm going to take one last question for Michael. Or involve them through, through Zoom. <laughs> Right. Well, we've had them on Zoom, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, Michael Wayne, I'm gonna. You will be the last question. Okay. Well, thank you, Georgia, and thank you, David. Um, you know, definitely inspiring and enlightening to listen to you. And um, throughout the, this um, question and answer period, I've had quite a few different questions I thought of asking. <laughs> I think uh, I'll I'll stick with this for the sake of time. Um, even though what Ben wrote about Davos being adopted. Um, strengthened administrative state. I just want to, this is not my question, but I just want to comment. It saves this, this approach we're doing right now, which I think is really good, saves the Jamie Diamonds of the world who are really, you know, the big power brokers and the problems. But anyway, I, I want to, yeah, I, I just want to um, add on or bring up, you talked about democracy. Mm -hmm. and, and as we know, a political system, democracy always gets married to an economic system here in America. This, this unfettered predatory capitalist system. And, and so you, you, um, you brought up the problem with democracy or, or whether we really have a democracy. I know a lot of uh, conservatives talk about the United States being a constitutional republic or a republic, not a democracy, but really what they mean is what we have here, an indirect democracy, and um, as opposed to a representational or direct democracy. And I think it goes back to, I believe it goes back to how the constitution was written and James Madison's um, 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 aristocratic uh, scorn for, for egalitarianism. And, and really Madison talked about the tyranny of majority, but really what he created and what we still have is the tyranny of the minority and, and that minority that just keeps ramrodding everything through. We're seeing a little break in the action now that actually a bill got passed for the majority, for the people. But um, um, yeah, from the filibuster and the electoral college and the makeup of the Senate. And, and as you brought up, the, the only people who had votes at one time were the uh, landowner slave owners and, and slaves had were three fifths of a person and women didn't vote and um, so on. So I, I, I wonder what you may, just, just to say all that, what comments you may have as to um, moving past the tyranny of minority, which we still have with the corporate state, with the Koch brothers, with this 
you know, if, with corporations doing whatever they want. So we have surveillance capitalism. And, and so what we can do to break this tyranny, that, that I guess is my long-winded way of leading, leading up to you, David. Well, I, th I think within this context, it's really interesting to uh, pick up on uh, the right wing commitment to what was the intention of the founders in writing the constitution. Well, if you take the constitution as written, um, it endorsed slavery and limited the vote to white male property owners, pretty much. Um, now we can argue that at least some of the founders had a much larger vision of where they wanted to go eventually, but at least the intention that is written into the constitution, um, if that is what we should be abiding by, it means we need to go back to limiting the vote to white male property owners and putting back in slavery. I mean, it's an absurd concept. <laughs> um, it's amazing to me that somehow that doesn't come out into the more openly into the conversation. I mean, is that what the originalists really have in mind? Um, I, I, I think that that surely ought to guarantee they're getting voted out of office very quickly. Yeah. Which help us in 2022. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know, that's I, I'd say by that, I'm, I'm, I'm also, I think, you know, we're very fortunate now that we got, uh, you know, Biden as our president in the United States. Not that, I mean, the, the, the big advantage he has is, is I, I think his intentions are good, but he also has the enormous experience mm -hmm. and the enormous number of connections to, to, to bring together and actually to step into office quickly as he's done and to begin to move the agenda in a positive direction. Um, so it, it's, it, it, it really makes that a breakthrough moment. Um, now, in terms of the absurdities of our, of our current situation, um, Fran have to remind me that, it, was it Orange County? That the, you know, the population of this one county in California is greater than Seven states. Huh? Los Angeles County has more population than all any other beyond seven large states. Okay, so there's only seven existing states that have a larger population than Orange County. Los Angeles County. Los Angeles County, yeah. So you think about that in terms of, and, and what percentage of the votes <laughs> at the national level does Los Angeles County have? Um, I mean, it, it's just how out of whack our existing structure is from any, any kind of perspective of what do we mean by democracy? I oh. think we are. I think we're out of questions and we're just about out of time. We've taken the, the full time that we allot and this has been really exciting, uh, David. I have actually a lot of ideas for future discussions that came out of today. And we have it all recorded as you can see and we have the closed captioning available so it's all written out as well as recorded. And we have the chat box saved. I always edit it and usually send it out to everybody who's on the call. So um, that will be coming up next. Do you have any final words you want to say before we end, David? It just, it's, it's been an extraordinary uh, experience to gather with you, so many of you friends from, uh, from our, uh, our, our past, but coming back together around this agenda and, uh, and having a discussion at this level of depth, which is exactly what we need to be moving forward. And thank you, Georgia, for making it happen. I think you're helping us with uh, our next discussion topics. So thank you for that. And I'll, we'll talk about this. You so could. thank you everybody for your wonderful questions and your attentiveness. It's been an extraordinary program. And please do tune in next week to hear uh, Elizabeth and see Elizabeth Satoris. Also, not, also. not Elizabeth said tourist. <laughs>
<laughs> also, if you want to save the chat and transcript yourself, you can, assuming you're on the screen where you see everyone's face, you can go down to live transcript, view full transcript, and then you'll see a button on the side where you can just save it. Um, 